So let's start here then on purpose with why we're here. And to get a sense of right now tonight, no more waiting that you're gonna open to, that you have already opened to more wholehearted living. More wholehearted living, whatever that would look like for you. It could be more childlike, not childish, but childlike. Something that I'm gonna be more interested in things that make my tail wag. I'm gonna be noticing where, you know, Dr. David Hawkins, do y'all know his work? Dr. David Hawkins, he wrote several books and one um, I'm studying now and using in a group every month called Letting Go, The Pathway to Surrender. And he speaks in most of his writing that everything in life either strengthens us or it weakens us. Everything, including foods including attitudes, thoughts, and we know this from basic new thought, basic unity, whatever thought I'm holding is going to produce an experience of that. So if I look up on a flat tire and call it awful, what am I going to experience? Now I've just created something awful for me instead of just calling it what it is. So if I just looked up on the flat tire and called it a flat tire, what would I experience? Like, I mean, bummer, you know, no sane person's gonna get out and do a happy dance over having a flat tire. But we're, we're not also, we're not gonna be taken down by it either. So this is the, this is the difference here that to call things factually actually what they are. So my first tip tonight is to keep a clear distinction between facts and feelings. So it's a flat tire. There's not a lot of feeling with that. It's awful. It's just so awful. Notice the feelings that come with that despair, frustration, irritation, even terror maybe, scared, what am I gonna do? So get a sense then of if I can approach things after tonight, a bit more factual based. So she didn't call me back, factual. She didn't call me back, comma, she doesn't value me. Now, where's the feelings kick in? Mm -hmm. After the comma. She didn't call me back, period. So my second tip is power to the period. Power to the period. She didn't call me back, period. There's not a lot of feeling in that. There's not a lot of pain in that. There's not a lot of suffering in that. It's actual she didn't call me back. But if I don't get that period in there, then everything after that period becomes a comma, then she doesn't respect me. She doesn't love me. She doesn't appreciate me. She's a B-I-T-C-H and I don't appreciate it a bit. And after all I've done for her and hi-ho, hi-ho, off to hell we go. Uh -huh. So all the hell is after the comma. So what's actual and factual, keeping a clear distinction between facts and feelings. That's the first tip. Second tip is power to the period. So think about something in your life that you could put a period in. How you would be better off. I invited her to lunch and she said no. period. But if we got a comma in there, what's the mind going to make it up to me? I invited her to lunch and she said no. How are you going to interpret that?
She doesn't care about me. She's disrespectful. I can't trust her. She owes me. So everything we interpret is where our suffering is. And we can't live wholeheartedly because then we got to guard the heart. And this is a word, um, to Brene Brown, if you look at her work at all, she speaks about armoring, armoring our heart, which is the opposite to open-hearted, undefended heart, wholehearted, but to armor the heart and then to take score, to take their inventory, interpret their actions, and then believe what we made up about it. So we make up, we interpret why she hadn't called us back and then believes what we made up about it. Then we armor our heart so we can't be hurt by it going forward. At any time you have a question or comment or anything, please weigh in here because I want this, I want tonight to be something that's interactive enough that you have some takeaways for this. So it's not just Martha Creek's blah, blah, blah. But like, this is making sense to me. These are tips, the kindest feedback I ever receive is it was practical. This was practical. I could apply this to something. I could use this in my daily life. I could use this in a relationship. I could use this in a situation. So that's my, that's my motive and intention for tonight as, as usual. Go ahead, Faye Marie, your hand is up. I was only going to add, this is another way of saying judgment because we have this, um, so many are walking in judgment without even realizing it. It's, it becomes like breathing in and out, this area of interpretation, which is really a judgment. And if we're not judging, there's really no need for forgiveness because there's nothing to forgive if there's no judgment. It's absolutely the truth, honey. I just noticed that I couldn't stop judging. And I was so ashamed of judging and don't be judgmental don't be judgmental please just anything but judgmental be compa be understanding be compassionate and the mind is a judging machine all it does is judge day in and day out 24 hours a day seven days a week so everything is a judgment up down black white tall short fat skinny too much too little so i've had to accept the judgments I have to accept that it's a judging machine and to come out from the shame of that. You know, I even tease that if I ever started a church again, I would open it with welcome to the church of so-and-so. We're a judgmental bunch around here. <laughs> welcome here. Just come on in and be at home with the rest of us because, you know, the, the scripture doesn't say not to judge. It says judge ye not then lest, not. lest you be judged lest you understand that it's you that you're judging exactly so not just judge away just know that whatever i'm judging is a reflection of myself totally. so whatever judgment i put on them judge ye not lest you understand it's you that you're judging so if there's one creator, one creator of all that is, then I'm an aspect of that creation. Then there's nothing in creation that I'm not or I have the potential to be. And the mind will come in, well, I've never, I'm, I'm not a murderer. I'm not a murderer. Like I can't say that I'm a murderer. It's like, well, I'm just a thought away from it. Mm -hmm. If I was believing what they're believing, I would shoot somebody too. If I was believing what they're believing, I, I could be a murderer. Right. People that are in that are vegan say I am a murderer because I eat animals and animal products. So it's all relative. Exactly. And I would swat a fly, a lizard, I'd kill a snake if I could reach it. So mm -hmm. others that protect snakes and bugs would call me a murderer. 
So it's not that far out to even relate to being a murderer. Oh, it's not. So there's nothing in the world that we can't, if our minds are open enough to it, our heart is open enough to it to say, just because I haven't murdered doesn't mean I wouldn't. Or well, and, and we murder, we murder in, in, in uh, other ways. When we take away someone's uh, dignity or reputation or gossip or whatever. And, and um, so, yes, amen. So the, so the opposite of understanding, the opposite of giving space for it. So let's just pause here for a minute and see, starting now, if you accepted that your mind is a judging machine, that you're going to be judgmental all the way to your grave. And if you didn't mind what that would be like. What would it be like to accept that that's its operating system? But, but it's not judgment, also discernment. Well, in, in interpreted that way, of course. I mean, like I've got to discern anything. Um, and it's like pausing so I can think about it. And making the judgment I'm referring to is name calling, you know, and and blaming and finger pointing and nitpicking and fault finding and that kind of judgment. But the right use of judgment is to discern what kind of sensible action I can take here and what would more sensible action be for me in this situation that I'm in. And then it's a wise use of the judging. It's a wise use to say, and even not, and then practically, I'd have to have judgment to know that stove is too hot for me to touch it. And I say, I carried this bag around on my shoulder for several years and wondered why my shoulder ached. <laughs> I, the, the weight of that bag was too much for my shoulder. And it's like, it, it's not sensible. Instead of like blaming my shoulder and pushing my shoulder to carry on instead of like, changing that bag and lightening the load, like taking some things out of that bag or getting a roll on bag or something else, just things that sound ridiculous, but how much we do it and do it and do it without ever um, admitting the consequences of it. Because I lacked discernment. I didn't pause to say what would be more sensible action here. So take a big deep breath. Mm -hmm. Hi, Michael. Glad you're here, honey. We got Canada in the house. Hey, Marie, was your was your hand up again, honey? Yes, I was going to to add to that, Martha. That <clears throat> when we have the judgment, as we as we grow more in that place of love and the Christ mind, then the judgment becomes kind of like I, I don't think about breathing. I I it it, it becomes automatic and as we grow and develop and, and lose a lot of that BS ego then then our automatic quote judgment or assessment or discernment becomes that breathing in that knowing of our oneness with that other that there but for the grace of God go I well just think about what that one thing would do for us I mean I mean, one thing that we take away from tonight to, to keep a distinction between facts and feelings, to get a period in there, and then to say, whatever's happening, whatever I'm seeing out there is a mirror reflection of myself, but to do that minus the hate, mm -hmm. minus the self-hate and minus the shame, just like only by the grace of God go I. Like if I'm just one thought away from doing what they're doing. So it's more humble humility, which is one of my favorite words. And I used to hate it because I heard people say they were humiliated. I was just so humiliated. And I, I got, I, I was just so struck by that. Like, 
humiliated. And it seemed like for me, it was a virtue. <laughs> so I looked up the word and it says something like the essence of being reduced to nothing. Beautiful. And I think I, I like that. I do too. I like that because it's easier to be a nobody than it is to effort to try to be a somebody mm -hmm. to keep all that pretense going and all that jockeying for a love and, and appreciation and approval and acknowledgement. And it sucks the very spirit out of us versus people or some will and Please make a note if you're making notes of this. <laughs> it's being recorded. So if any of you want it, just tell um, me or tell Brandon and he'll send you out the recording link. And you can reach me at Martha Creek at gmail.com, Martha Creek at gmail.com. And it is to, to admit that that um, I don't, I can't keep up this efforting, this, this, as Dr. Hawkins wrote, the things that are weakening me are, is my seeking. I'm seeking for somebody to think something of me. I'm seeking for them to see me a different way. I'm seeking for their love. I'm seeking for their approval. I'm seeking for them to appreciate me. And then that drains my spirit off. That drains my wholehearted living off. So all of that seeking weakens me. So Imagine what it would be like that after tonight, you stop speaking. Like if you accepted, some will like me and some won't. So what? So that's my greatest spiritual lesson so far. SW, SW, SW. Some will respect me, some won't. So what? Some will include me, some will exclude me, so what? And then the power, the so what holds such power because they, they exclude me, they include me. So what am I going to do when they exclude me? So what? H how am I going to be with this? Which is where all the power is. That's where my wholehearted living comes in. When they reject me, don't include me, don't like me, disrespect me, whatever else, all of my power lies in how am I going to be with this interaction? How am I going to be with this feeling? How am I going to be with this loss? So all the power resides there. And if I don't ask a question that leans the mind into what else can I do? It's patterned and programmed to go into poor, pitiful me. After all I've done for God. Mm. Look at how this has turned out. So big, deep breath. Welcome, Roseanne. Delighted to see you, honey. Wonderful to see you. Amy, go ahead, honey. Your hand's up. I was just going to say that um, my judgment is always a lot of times based on wherever I am in consciousness at that particular time, you know, whether I'm in victim consciousness or I'm in, or, or I'm in a higher space. Um, I, always, I learned years ago, halt, which is hungry, angry, lonely, tired. And to use that as a, you're supposed to halt if you're feeling any of those things before you react or respond. Um, and that has been helpful for me. But I know that if I can be aware of where I am in consciousness and own it, like own when I'm feeling like a victim, um, then it makes a huge difference um, in how I'm going to react. It would, honey. Of course it would. And we can also say, before I fire off that email or fire off a text somewhere, I need to halt myself, which is Martha Cree's three P's, which is pause, presence myself, then proceed, which is pause, pray, <laughs> then proceed. Because 
If I don't, I respond from a knee jerk, instinctual reactive place that loves to be offended and loves to be righteous and indignant instead of I want to elevate my consciousness. I wanna elevate, I wanna go up in the penthouse instead of out of the basement. I, I don't wanna send a basement response. I wanna come on up to at least the mid, mid brain to get a little more playful about it and on up to the higher, the upper room, you know, the scriptures re refer to this as the upper room before I respond. And if we believe any of these teachings, my failure to do that has just created more of that in the world. So all the poison arrows I send out in the world are on their way back to me, multiplied. And even if I just put a little poison in there, just a little, just enough to teach them a lesson. <laughs> just a teeny little bit of poison. <laughs> can, can relate? Mm. You know, I'm going to give her a lesson in kindness. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I have just exponentially put that out in the world. So... It matters what you're describing, Amy. It matters that I pause long enough to get myself in a better frame of mind, to elevate my consciousness and to, and not to, you know, I'm not recommending at all repressing feelings or suppressing feelings or disowning feelings because we've got a, we've got decades of that, a millennia of that where it's biting us in the buttocks, pardon the term. But that, that depressed emotion, that repressed emotion, that denying that we have anger and all of that is coming out in spades like a pressure cooker here. So in no way am I recommending suppressing, depressing, disown, disowning and disintegrating from feelings. Um, and I want to have feelings, I have them. I want to be aware of the feelings I have and I don't want the feelings running the show. Because I cannot live wholeheartedly and I can't live in sustained relationships that I have if I keep letting feelings be the way that I ex react and express. <laughs> so some pausing in there, some presencing of myself before I respond. And it's the difference between reacting and responding. Mm. And I pulled a couple of readings for tonight. So let me read this one. This is from Pema Children. And I'm, I'm leading into next month, I'm starting five weeks of dealing with a tsunami of grief. And that's what it's called. And that's my direct experience that there's seldom anybody on the phone with me calling me for support or mentoring or whatever they call me. They call me mentor and tormentor. So, um, but 90% of the people calling mm -hmm. have had a significant loss this year. I mean, uh, family members, they couldn't visit, couldn't get in a hospital with, children, overdoses, losses, weddings canceled, trips canceled, all sorts of things. And um, not to mention what we've had in the past and that we've tried to pretend we're okay through. So I'll be working with that. So this is one of the sessions that I'll open this with. So here's what she says. Things are going to fall apart. Things falling apart is a kind of testing. It's also a kind of healing. We think that the point is to pass the test or to overcome the problem. But the truth is, and I'm gonna go with a capital T truth, but the truth is things are not meant to be solved. Things don't really get solved. 
they come together and they fall apart. Then they come together again and then they fall apart again. And then it comes together again and then it falls apart again. That's the way of it. It's just like that. So the healing comes from letting there be room for all of this to happen. The healing comes from letting there be room for all of creation to happen. Room for the grief, room for relief. And there's no grief without some relief. So don't try to believe me. Just look to see what was your direct experience. Even when the people that were closest to you, that was just so close, you couldn't have loved any better. There's grief and there's relief. There's room for misery, for suffering, and there's room for joy. Him a children from when things fall apart. So I'd love to hear your reflections on this. What comes to mind when you hear this? To make room for all of it. You may as well. So how would the mind resist this? What can you take away from hearing this reading, anybody? Hey, Marie. A couple of years ago, um, I, um, I'm normally quite healthy, and yet the manifestation in my body uh, ended me in 11 days in a life-threatening situation in the hospital. And this betrayal, what I was shown by spirit was that even though I was walking in a pretty really wonderful healed th way uh, in terms of some of the things we've been talking about tonight. I had this buildup of this grief that you're speaking of as a result of the uh, severe five and a half years of betrayal and probate from hell from my daughter slash niece, who was just, you know, my mentoree and like my daughter for her entire entire 40 year life and she turned and tried to take over the whole estate and of my mother and I realized you know I it was just it was just the most hellish thing I mean divorce is a Sunday picnic compared to that <laughs> and so it was it has become now one of the most beautiful life-giving stories in my life because I realized in that hospital that that this was a buildup of grief from years and it was a tsunami of grief and I I hear you loud and clear and it was probably one of the greatest blessings of my entire life and one day I'll probably write something on my blessed enemies because they're our greatest teachers. Thank you, honey. Thank you. Well, and, and, you know, I, I, be, I believe then that you're referring to like what the course, this course, this little one hour that we have together is to look to see, because as a result of that, I went into more wholehearted living. Yes. That that grief I had some awakening from that that said, I'm going to be different now. I'm going to live in the world different than I was before that happened. Yeah. You know, and Eckhart Tolle says that being spiritual has nothing to do with what we believe. Mm -hmm. We prance around all day long with platitudes and affirmations and whatever else when we don't even believe what we're affirming. <laughs> it's, you know, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, so, totally. 
it's all good. It's all good. It's like, well, tell your face. Yes. It's not caught up mm-hmm. to it's all good. And maybe in the absolute it is, but back here at the ranch, <laughs> no, we're, we've not caught up to it's all good yet. <laughs> what it actually says is being spiritual has nothing to do with what you believe. It has everything to do, being spiritual has everything to do with your state of consciousness. Yes. Your state of consciousness. So mm-hmm. if, we can, if we continue to live in a regressed state of consciousness, which is a reactive state of consciousness, agree, um, apathetic, resigned, angry, irritated, frustration, then we're stuck in that same little part of the animal brain that we've been in for millennia versus even just getting up here a little bit to say, if I can do just a little more wholehearted living, I can make the choices I'm making day by day by day by day, situation by situation, interaction by interaction, person by person, then that's what's going to elevate my state of consciousness. So I'm not going to be waiting for a transformation of consciousness, but I'm actually going to be doing things minute to minute, situation by situation that is going to expand and elevate my consciousness. Something, um, instead of waiting for it to happen to me, I'm waiting for a transformation of consciousness. And then, you know, some of us high righteous spiritual types act like we've, we're already there. Like, oh my God, I'm, I'm already in, I live a life of gratitude. It's like, there's nobody that lives a life of gratitude. You have gratitude moments. And then the second you don't get what you want, you're right back to a tantrum. <laughs> and whatever your tantrum looks like, you know, um, which could be a slight irritation or not an irritation or, or, or an outright frustration, just anger, pitiful, pathetic, um, getting even, <laughs> whatever the case may be, while we're claiming to be in a, in a consciousness of gratitude. It's like just a thought away, just a one thought away from reverting again. The, the opposite of wholehearted, which is going up, going up in consciousness. Go ahead, Amy. When you were talking about that, the first thing that came to mind to me is um, Mary Shaping Carpenter has a song that like sometimes you're the windshield and sometimes you're the bug. Um, and that's the thing <laughs> that we all or the song you know, everybody plays the fool because um, we all do at I mean I know I have um, I've been humbled enough in life to know that but when you were talking about um, Pima Sheldon's reading the first thing that came to mind to me was reconciliation and order um, because there's a natural reconciliation things come together and they fall apart and then they come together and they fall apart there's a reconciliation that kind of happens in that process and, and in order like I I know that in New England I mean we're just starting to see spring now <laughs> um, but you know a month ago it was all mucky and gross and ugly and ew <laughs> and that's all part of that natural order now it's glorious you know the trees are blooming and it's lush and green and it's like oh yeah this is why I live in New England but um but that muck and that goo is all part of that part of the order and if I can remember that I can it can take the sting out and I can breathe a little bit better and I can expect that that's going to happen absolutely honey which comes out brings us out of a fantasy world a fantasy world that we've been living since we were three you know, that, oh, it's not going to include any of that versus no, it's going to include that. Life includes all of it. And it's like this return to reality or more suffering and then perpetuating more suffering in the world. And then we, we could, I mean, we couldn't be shocked then, honey, when the seasons do what the seasons do. But no, in my fantasy, we're not going to have that season. Or when people do what people do. And it's like, well, in my fantasy, he wasn't like that. It's like, yeah, but then good old reality shows up. 
And our, uh, our opposing reality is where all the suffering is, which keeps us from living like in touch with reality, which would then leave us less affected when we don't get what we want. When things doesn't go the way we fantasize, it's like, this is the lay of the land here. This is the way of it. And until I get firmly planted in reality, then I'm just like a leaf on a tree blowing whichever way the wind blows, still believing in a fantasy. Like my spouse should understand me. <laughs> Children should be well behaved. Oh, really? <laughs> exactly, Mary Lou. Like what planet do you live on? And then there, most of them are more well behaved than we are. They're more honest about their tantrums. You know, they'll just have one, but we, we got to be subtle and spiritual about it. You know, we'll just go gossip about somebody. We'll hold that grudge for a while. Well, all the way to the grave in some cases. And we maybe would be healthy if we just threw ourselves on the, on the ground in the kitchen screen. Got well, on? think about it. Think about it. If we just now, you know, you may not want to do this with people, they'll put you in an institution. Right. But I mean, to have some, no. to just have some outright good old tantrum here and there, to, to just express it, to just say what I need to say to that's people journal, you know, to like express some of that, to excavate some of that safe anger work where you can just rant and rave and use profanity. Those of you that are practiced in the work, know to put it out on worksheets you know I'm mad about this I wanted them to do that they should do this I need them to do that it just dumps off some of that which is like having a mind dump and until we do some of this until we move some of this ick out of us we we don't we, we don't have much of a life you know we call it a life but it's not much of a life because so much of it is spent trying to hold a big giant ball underwater Instead of like, let the ball out. Let's just see what we got here. Let's just turn the rocks over and see what kind of bugs are under here. And then deal with them, you know, purposefully, intentionally. Go ahead, Roseanne. Hi, honey. Unmute. Okay. Hi, everybody. I, uh, when you read the um, Pima Chodron, When Things Fall Apart, it's, it's just, even the title at this moment makes me happy because it's like, oh, they're supposed to fall apart. Like, you know, moving from that, trying to hold it together all the time. So exhausting. And then when I do fall apart, feeling somehow that, you know, something's wrong with me because it fell apart, you know? And so I'm just taking a lot of relief out of, yeah, the dance of it, the back and forth, and that I'm too spiritual to fall apart. You know, I've got my spiritual toolbox is too packed full of spiritual tools that if I could just pick up the right one and you don't know how to, when to use it, I would be uh, just a spiritual giant right here, right now, all the time. And so things would never have to fall apart. I mean, it's, it's, you, you know, my, my insanity very well. <laughs> well, I I'm, I'm yeah, know yours, honey. <laughs> What'd you say? I have to know mine. Yes. How I know your insanity. Oh, get, yes. Because, yeah. I'm, I'm a little bit of a mirror. <laughs> well, drop the little honey. And it, <laughs> um, and so turn it around, honey. I'm too, I'm, I've got too much of a spiritual toolbox to not just express this. Oh, you're saying turn around. I've got too much, my, I've got too much of a spiritual toolbox to pretend like it's okay all the time. To pretend like this is okay and to repress this and to deny this because well, it will not be denied. Right. No, it will not. Yes. No, it will not. Uh, okay, thank you. I have too much of a spiritual toolbox to not admit when things do fall apart. 
and that they're going to, that it's they're going to, heard, that it's predictable, of course, and I'm going to also, and it's no different if, 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 if I, and it's like, you may as well be saying if I was a giraffe. I'm going to, I'm, you know, it also helped me for, for you to hear how many people have had significant losses recently, because of course I have. And in the grief, uh, I, I don't know, it feels good at this moment to say, I, I am going to fall apart. There will, there, will, there will be moments where I fall apart. Well, get a sense of that in your body, honey. Yeah. Like, even grinning about it. Like, like it's a higher state of consciousness to tell the doggone truth. Yes. And not to deny the truth. Yeah. Did you say stop grinning about it? What did you say? I said, it looks good on you. You're actually grinning about it. Oh. You're grinning. You're saying, hey, I'm going to fall apart. It feels good to be able to laugh about it because you know I've had... I had two full days at the beginning of this week where I just didn't think I was gonna be able to keep going. Yeah. And so it feels good to laugh. And I like what you said about the turnaround. Um, I have too big of a spiritual toolkit to not admit that I, uh, I, I do fall apart from time to time. Yeah. And that I'm going to, and that it's normal to. And that, that it's normal. normal. Yes. That it's normal and it's okay for me to fall apart Yes. And ride the wave of the falling things falling apart and coming back together. Yes. Yeah, see if all of you can say that. Put yourself on mute if you want to, or just speak it silently. It's okay to fall apart. Okay. It's okay to have intense feelings. It's okay. It's oh, I'm okay. I am. My experience is okay. It's okay. Things will fall apart. I will react to things falling apart. Gosh, that's powerful. It's almost like giving myself permission. I mean, it is, honey. It really is to be human, to be a human being. Yeah. And it's like this notion that it's spiritual not to. <laughs> It's like, it's a, it's a, it's a, the epitome of spiritual abandonment. The epitome of spiritual abandonment to deny our humanity. That our human aspect is a part of our divine aspect. And we're, we, we're, we call it, you know, om, 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 that's real good. But oh, 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 is, isn't. Versus no, no, both, both and, both That's and. And then to think about this, like, um, so just take these words in, just listen to these, close your eyes even if you can. This is from Mary Oliver. You do not have to be good. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about your despair. Tell me about despair, yours, and I can tell you about mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes. Moving across the landscapes, the prairies, the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. And meanwhile, the wild geese, high in a clear blue air, the wild geese again are heading home. Whoever you are, 
no matter how lonely the world offers itself to your imagination, it calls to you like the wild geese. Life calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting and over and over and over announcing your place in the family of things. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely the world offers itself, life is calling you like the wild geese over and over and over announcing your place in life, your place in the family of things. Big deep breath. So what if you gave up efforting? And it's different than like a challenge of yourself. I think I said this Sunday, did I give the example of the soccer field, which was so telling for me, like my, my coach used that, like, I don't mean, cause we're built for challenge. We're built to think, to innovate, to collaborate. So it's not that it's, it's, you know, so I say, somebody just quoted me this week is worry takes a bad rap. So worry see, and this is proven, you can read about it scientifically. Worry is helpful because it activates the brain that can, the part of our brain that can innovate, that can find a way, that can strategize. So that's not the worry I'm talking about. It's worry about something that we can't change. Worry about something we have no control over whatsoever. That's the worry that keeps us from wholehearted living versus looking at any situation and going, what can I change about this situation? What would be sensible action for me? And I'm gonna go in that direction. And I'm gonna get more and more awake to what I can't do a darn thing about. And I'm going to tell my truth. I'm going to tell. I'm going to tell me the truth about that. I can't do a darn thing about that. So it's going to it's going to weaken me and suck the spirit out of me if I put my energy over there. So I've got to know when to fold them, and I got to say I'm going to spend then more time in my life changing what I can. And you've heard it before, many of you. And wiser and wiser and wiser to know the difference mm -hmm. of what I can change and what I cannot. Hey, okay, Marie, go ahead. Oh, I forgot I had my hand up. I That was a while back. And I was just going to say that about being real, that Jesus um, uh turned over the money changers tables and he wept when he was grieved. And so um, if our way shower uh, had those manifestations of human emotions, then of course it just, it, I mean, it's a no brainer that we as well are going to uh, not just be okay to do that, but need to do that. Yeah. So if somebody, let's say God, gave you permission tonight to stop doing three things, what would you stop doing? If you went, I'm not going to do them again. I do not like them. I dread them. 
they drain me, they weaken me, it sucks the spirit out of me. What's two or three things you would actually quit if you weren't afraid to? Roseanne says, saying yes when I mean no. Uh -huh, Vicki, go ahead, honey. Michael says, trying to please others, living to please somebody else, absolutely hopeless to do it. Vicki, go ahead. I find it very interesting that um, a couple of weeks ago I was in the hospital and I've been in the hospital several times in my life. And, but this time it was different. Um, it was different because my partner Tammy couldn't be with me. And it was different because I, I felt like, I kept feeling like I was just gonna pass out and die. And uh, I was speaking to my sister and she said, well, you're gonna be all right and you're gonna be this, you're gonna be that. And, and so it's like, well, it's okay if we all come over and, you know, and, and I haven't, we haven't had anyone in the house, but, you know, she was saying like, yeah, it's all right. It's all right. You're going to be all right. And it, it came to my mind, like, you have no idea what I went through. But then what, what followed that was, how could you have an idea if I'm always saying, Oh, it was all right. Oh, it wasn't that bad. I and I and I realized I came to the realization that I always diminish what I'm feeling or or um, downsize whatever I'm going through, and I have always done that. All the times that I'm in the hospital, oh, I'm going to be okay. Oh, don't worry about me. I'm going to be okay. And it took this last time for me to finally get it. Like, why am I doing this to myself? Why am I not allowing myself to be truthful and say, it was hell. <laughs> it really was. And, and after I spoke with her, I told myself, I will not do that anymore. I will be truthful about how I feel and what I'm going through. Let's have a group. A. <laughs> <laughs> so you rock it, honey. Well, this is what wholehearted living is about, honey. Like another example. I just... realized that when you start to talk and, and to tell us about it, it's like, that's exactly what I, what I just went through. It absolutely is. And that's what I mean by Vicki using it in situation by situation, person by person, every, as I go along, honey. And then I'm going to look at how much that was bothering me, what I wasn't saying. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say it. Right. Why was I pretending that I always felt like I had to be strong, that I had to be okay? Well, because we've made not being strong Bad. Right. Instead right. Of trying to be strong all the time is like trying to only inhale. I'm not going to exhale at all. I'm just going to inhale. I prefer inhales. Right. It cannot yeah. be okay. absolutely cannot be done. But we're walking around gasping for breath, trying to pretend that we're strong instead of like I'm strong at times and I'm not strong at times. I was hammered. It was hard. It was hell. And I've not been saying that. So then I keep saying, oh yeah, fine, fine, fine. And then wonder why a dozen of them are in my house when I'm having to crawl around to make them a meal or something instead of like telling the dog on truth. So good for you, honey, good for you. So Faye Marie says, dropping any and all negative self-talk. Now this, I mean, that, that, that changes your whole trajectory for your life, honey, to say, I'm gonna quit hating myself I'm going to quit raking me over the coals. So start to watch this in your languaging. And then it, like it's not trying to please anybody. Like I'm going to tell the truth about my condition, what I have energy for, what I don't have energy for, what I have interest in, and what I don't have interest in. Somebody said yesterday in a session, 
that she's she's feeling suffocated in her relationship because her husband's burning through like he retired and he's reading five books a week and he wants to tell her about all the books. <laughs> like, I cannot hardly do anything but roll my eyes. I don't give a rat's patoot what the books are about. I wanted to read the books as I read the doggone books. Yeah. But she cannot tell her to save her soul. And she said, well, how would you tell him, Martha? And I said, well, I would tell him, I have no interest in the books. Now I have an interest in you. I love you. I want our relationship intact. I care about our relationship, but I don't care a thing about the books you're reading. Like, oh my God, it's so simple. And it is when you're less afraid and when you get a little practice at wholehearted living. And guess why I could tell him I'm not interested in the books? It would help you to feel better. Right. And because I would want him to tell me. Mm. And I, 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 I keep putting out in the world the opposite of what I want to see and then act surprised when I don't get it. It's like, so if I want to be in relationships where somebody can be that authentic and that honest and that direct to say, Martha, I, I, I love you, Martha, but I don't care. I don't care what you're reading. Like, I don't, I don't care at all. I have no interest in it whatsoever. I'd much rather know that than we can find what we are interested in. Instead of keeping up this pretense, this dog and pony show, like, oh my God, I'll listen to you talk about a book, you know. It's like prostitution, really. <laughs> so I, I don't want it in the world, so I can't keep putting it out in the world. Mainly. Go ahead, Mary Lou. When Michael typed, trying to please others, what came to my mind is. I decide what those other people want me to do to please them. I don't even know, a rat's ass, what they want of me. I decide. And then I lay guilt on myself because I didn't live up to this made up story. I think if I was a dog, I'd be chasing my tail. Well, we are, you know. But get a sense, Mary Lou, if you drop that. Like if you, whatever you do for people after tonight, you do it because it felt right to you. You know, like I used to, I'd take somebody a cup of tea because I thought they would want a cup of tea. And then they wouldn't drink the cup of tea. And I'd be like, well, how dare you? Oh my God, I gave you the best tea I have. I mean, do you know how much that tea cost? Oh my God, do you know how carefully I made that tea? And then I realized I gave them that, I gave them that cup of tea for me. I felt better giving them the cup of tea. Then it makes no difference if they ever drink it or not. The, the tea can just sit there and grow mold. It's fine because I gave them the cup of tea because it felt right for me to do that. But that's what I meant by we stop that seeking, you know, we stop seeking them. Oh, thank you, Martha. Oh, you're so kind, Martha. Oh, thank you. You're so generous, Martha. Oh, that's the best tea I've ever had, Martha. <laughs> oh, that's my drug, you know. Woo, I'm high now. Woo. Instead of like, that was their consciousness. Their response to the tea is a reflection of their state of consciousness. Right. And this one's a full-time job. Right. This one here. So I just noticed the time. It's time to begin. <laughs> so that's our hour. Thank you very much for coming. Love to you all. I love knowing you're out there in the world. I love knowing that you're questioning what you're doing. I love knowing that you're one needle over toward telling the doggone truth after tonight and your wholehearted living. And if there's ever a way I can serve you, get directly in touch with me. And it's right through the website. My phone number's there, email, everything, marthacreek.com.
and I lead three or four classes a month that are free, that are uh, surrendering the pathway to letting go, the Christ consciousness, the universal Christ consciousness. And I had a funny one this week from that. I hope you'll come into that class because I've got my Christ consciousness on and somebody rang my doorbell that didn't have an appointment. <laughs> All of somebody. All I could do was laugh like, oh, let me get my Christ consciousness on. <laughs> Let me pause and get my cross consciousness on before I go to the door, just before I start my cross consciousness class. <laughs> keep coming, keep your practices up and know that you're loved. Yeah. MarthaCreek.com if I can support you. Blessings.